Now, as we've uh, consistently emphasized to you, we're not Bible students as much as we are conceptual students. In other words, what we're looking at is not just data and information as given to us in the Bible. What we're looking for is the concept that's at the heart of the data and the information. So when you come to this parable, you can go through all of the details of the information, but what we're really desiring to look at is what is the concept that he's trying to share in giving us this parable. And parables are really dangerous because you can just go off and make up all kinds of things uh, as, you, as you have a good imagination like I do. So you have to stay close into the parable itself and what he's trying to say. So we've been trying to develop for you and with you uh, through these weeks as we've been dealing with this parable. We've been t- trying to develop with you the concept that he's trying to give to us. And we've broken the concept into three ideas. One idea is the idea of uh, measurement, which is the idea that he always starts out in these parables, and especially in this one, with the small and moves to the large. For instance, in the parable of the mustard seed, which is given to you in verse 31, the mustard seed is the smallest seed they knew anything about that grew into the largest tree they knew anything about. So you've moved from the small into the large. Now he's doing the same thing in this parable, which is the idea of the leaven, which is a small amount that has now been moved into three measure of meal. So he's moved from the small to the large. And everywhere you go in the kingdom, that's the idea. He gave us that in the very definition of the kingdom itself when he told us that the essence of the kingdom is who you are, which is helpless, into who God is, which is unlimited resource. That's moving from the small into the large. And if the small, if the helpless, if the empty, if that which has no resource at all will open up to that which is total resource and absolute power and absolute might, there would come a merging between those two so that that which is lacking would no longer lack because what is not lacking has come to fill it and merge with it. We want that for your life. I want that for my life. But the key to that whole thing, he says, is I've got to embrace my helplessness. I have to admit, I have to stay in the boundaries of my smallness or I never know the hugeness of his being moving through me. And the minute I get out of the boundaries of my smallness and begin to think I'm something, that kills the whole process. So the very essence of the leaven is the smallness, the smallness of who I am being filled with the greatness of who he is. That's the progression. He also moves us into the con- in concept, not only to the, from the measure, but he moves us into the method. And of course, we discovered that the method of this whole operation of the kingdom as even given to us in the parable of the leaven is the method of uh, relationship. It is relational in its method. That God does not have a list of rules and you are to perform them while he watches. If that were the case, it would not be relational. It would be duty. It would be deed. It would be action done. And God would stand back and applaud because you are a a person doing all the right things. But you know you could do all the right things and never have an intimate relationship with God and what he's after is not you doing all the right things although you might but what he's after is the intimacy of relationship which is his whole dynamic definition of the kingdom itself that he wants to have intimate relationship with you and out of that intimacy there would come the right activities and we've been trying to emphasize with you anytime any place anywhere we're stating this again Anytime, any place, anywhere, we've stated it every day, every night we've preached on this. Anytime, any place, anywhere that anybody suggests to you that the heart of Christianity is a physical deed accomplished, you know they're dead off. Think that through. Because in the Christian world, you will have that coming at you and it's easy to get off on that and sidetrack to that and you miss it. Anytime, anyplace, anywhere 
that anybody suggests to you that a physical activity is the core and the focus of Christian experience, you know they're dead wrong. We understand the physical is intimately involved. And the physical, Christianity always plays itself out in the physical. It's never that the physical is downplayed or minor or insignificant. It's that the physical activity always spills out of the intimacy of relationship. So what God is really interested in is relationship that will so affect you that it will dynamically express itself through relationship and physical activity. How are you doing in relationship? Parable of the leaven is all about relationship. The leaven enters into the three measures of meal and invades through relationship. The whole concept of the parable is about relationship. The three measures of meal does nothing. The leaven invades its being and produces all that it needs. Now, the third concept or part of the concept that we're dealing with is the mastery, which is all over this parable, no question about it. And we spent a lot of time on this. The parable, as he tells it, is all about the leaven invading the three measures of meal until it is mastered. And he even uses the idea of till, until. Look at the, pa at the passage again. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. That's mastery. In other words, the goal, the completion, the idea, the fulfillment of the whole dynamic of the kingdom of heaven is that you are mastered by the leaven itself. It is not partial. It cannot be a little bit. It cannot be, well, some of me. Well, I'm half. There is a mastery that takes place or it's not accomplished. So the whole concept of half Christian is ridiculous, people. The whole idea of a little bit Christian, well, I'm kind of Christian. Well, well, I'm Christian on Sunday. That whole concept is laughable in light of the parable because the parable is all about Jesus infiltrating, mastering, coming into, literally infiltrating in relationship my, with my life and in that relationship at the core of my system, my whole being becomes mastered by that relationship which is what the parable is all about. So it's all about mastery. Now we took the idea, the concept of mastery and we've broken that concept down in three parts, and we've been walking through those three parts. One is the idea of fulfillment. See, the whole idea of the parable is that the king wants to come, he's the leaven, and wants to master the three measures of meal and form in that mastery the kingdom. Again, you are the dumb, he is the king. And it's then that mastery in that union that you become the kingdom. I guess that made sense to you. <laughs> Finally made sense. Something made sense. Wow. Now, in the fulfillment, in the fulfillment of this mastery, when he comes as king and is in charge, there's no way that the leaven cannot be in charge if this is going to work. The three measures of meal is going to relax and the leaven is going to infiltrate and invade, permeate and master. And that's the dynamic of the parable, which is likened to the kingdom. In other words, if I'm going to be a kingdom person Christian, he's going to have to be Lord of my life. 
not kind of Lord, not, and we went through the language of this, not Savior, and maybe I'll deal with Lordship later. He can't be Savior without being Lord because the very dynamic of Saviorhood is all wrapped up in Lordship. So if he's going to be my Savior, he's got to be my Lord because he cannot be who he's not. And if I am requiring him to save me without being Lord, I am pushing him to be something he's not and he cannot do that. So the whole dynamic of the parable is he's going to invade and be totally in charge of who I am. It's a mastery in the parable. Now, we broke this down into three parts. One is the fulfillment idea. The leaven fulfills. Oh, you got to get this. We've already talked about it another time, but this is really significant. The leaven fulfills the purpose for which the dough exists. Leave the leaven out of the three measures of meal and you haven't got a loaf of bread. You've got three measures of meal. And it will always remain three measures of meal, never having fulfilled its significance, never having reached its destiny, never having come to fulfillment until the leaven is invaded, invades the three measures. Get this. The leaven is not here to destroy the leaven is not here to hinder. The leaven is not here to kill all my fun. The leaven is not here to squelch. The leaven is not here to just make me miserable. The leaven is here for the fulfillment of my destiny. How can I explain that to you? It's in not allowing him to master my life that destruction comes. It's in the hindrance of his movement into the fullness of who I am that destroys me, that never allows my life to come into fruition. It's only in the complete surrender and the allowing of him to invade me, take total control, that my life becomes the fulfillment he's dreamed. And if you want your heart broken, I challenge you to walk down our streets and look into the eyes of people after person after person after person who knows nothing about fulfillment of their lives they exist and they live from one moment to another moment eking out every bit of pleasure happiness they can muster because that's all they have and life is empty What is it that's lacking? The leaven, which brings fulfillment to the three measures of meal. So your life, my life, will never, ever be, can you grasp this? Never, ever be the completeness that God has created and dreamed for me without his total, absolute control in my life so would you please surrender your whole being to him and find fulfillment this is why Jesus said in losing your life you find it and I shake my head and say in losing my life oh then I'm then I'm not finding it I'm losing it no because the leaven never destroys it fulfills 
So Jesus, let me say it again, is not here to take away your fun, not here to squelch your creativity, not here to damn you, not here to blockade you, not here to squelch you. He is here to blossom you, build you, fulfill you. It's the only chance I've got. So we've already talked about that. The second idea is function, fulfillment, yes. So the leaven invades in relational method, invades the three measures of meal in order to fulfill the destiny of the three measures of meal. But in function, there is a purpose beyond the three measures of meal. This is so awesome. And this is what we talked about actually the last time. There is a purpose beyond the dough, the three measures of meal. See, the leaven invades the three measures meal. Why? To blossom it out and make it a full loaf. Got that. I got that. But why is it going to be a full loaf? Why is it invading the three measures of meal to make a full loaf? Oh, because I have 15 kids that are starving to death. And they're going to eat. So there's a purpose beyond. You processing that? See, God wants to fulfill my life. Yes. My destiny is found in this. Yes. My life will be fulfilled in his invasion. Yes. In relationship with him and him being king of my life. Oh, it's going to be, woo. My life is going to be at the top level absolutely but this is not about me there's 15 kids that need to eat there's a mission that needs to be accomplished this is not about oh this is about whoa So the destiny that I'm looking for is not just in the fulfillment of my life, but the leaven wants to fulfill my life that out of that might become the larger fulfillment. Let me let you in on this. And the fulfillment is not just in the 80-year bracket of my lifetime. It is an eternal fulfillment that one billion years from this moment, God is still going to have significant purpose for the fulfillment of my life. I don't want to disappoint you, but if you think you're going to go to heaven and play a harp for eternity, you are wrong. You're going to work like a dog. There is going to be great purpose. He has significant things for you to do. As he has significant things for you to do in this time bracket, in the eternal time bracket, he has significant things for you to do. And this is not... I was at a camp meeting and uh, this lady had a button and she wanted to give me one of them and the button said, Heaven, the Christian's retirement. Heaven is the gold watch. Meaning what? Well, I work like a dog for 80 years, and now I get to go to heaven and relax and play shuffleboard and and just, uh, you know, just uh, hang around and drink lemonade and watch TV. I don't have... Yuck. (laughs) Who wants to do that? Do you want to live all eternity without purpose? I don't want to live one day without purpose. I want every day to count for something. That's the parable. That the parable is he's invading my life and fulfilling within me his great purpose. So I become the whole loaf invaded by him, fulfilled in him. I become the loaf that he has designed. Why? Because there's a purpose beyond the personal fulfillment. And the purpose is 
There's 12 kids, 15 kids that need to be fed. Now, you could help your purpose by not having 15 kids, but that's your business. <laughs> that's your business. Be on track. Now, here's what we want to talk about tonight. So, in this mastery, Jesus becoming king, in this mastery, he wants to master me, and out of that comes my personal fulfillment. He wants to master me so that out of that becomes not only my personal fulfillment, but the fulfillment beyond what is my personal, which is his plan for my life. And the third idea is, well, fullness. We're breaking it into three parts. One is purpose. Now, I may, I don't have any biblical proof for this, but I want to suggest an idea to you. That when Jesus stood and told these Jews about the parable, told them about the parable of the leaven, what would have registered in their mind would have been the feast of unleavened bread. You don't find that any place in the context. I understand. But the feast of unleavened bread was really strong with them. You see, they had the Passover. You know the Passover. You killed the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. The death angel passed over. That happened in Egypt. They celebrated that thing every single year from that point to this point, which was thousand years, hundreds of years. Every year they did it. That always happened on the, fifth, on the 14th of the first month of the year. The Passover happened on a Friday. The next day was the feast day of unleavened bread. And they celebrated it for seven days. In other words, for seven days, they ate unleavened bread, meaning three measures of meal that had no leaven in it. Which meant it was flat and it was hard. And the reason they did that is because when they came out of Egypt land, they didn't have time to put the yeast in and put it in a warm place and let it rise. They were on the move. They killed the lamb, ate the lamb. We got to move. So the bread had no yeast in it. So when Jesus observed the last supper and passed the bread, it was unleavened bread. And the bread without leaven was a symbol. They called it the bread of affliction, which was for the purpose of reminding them of all the hardship God brought them through to get them out of Egypt land. The slavery that they were in, the crossing of the Red Sea, the risking of their lives, the miracles that took place, all the kinds of the march and, uh, and journey that they had in the wilderness, the being without food, the being without meat, the being without water, all the things they had to walk through and experience was all symbolized in the gnawing on this cracker. Jesus comes along and says, what I want to tell you about is, I want to tell you that this business of the kingdom is the leaven now being planted into the three measures of meal. Which is going to bring to you an internal delight, an internal fulfillment, an internal purpose 
that can't be found in unleavened bread. The bread of affliction. How is this leaven, how is the unleavened going to become leaven? There is a process. And I found that process, not in the scriptures, but on Google. <laughs> this is good, isn't it? We've gone from the Bible to Google. It's called kneading, not N E E D, but K N E A D. See, the leaven is put into the three measures of meal and it just sits there. It doesn't invade the loaf, the three measures of meal. It just sits there. You have to knead, K-N-E-A-D, the meal, the dough. Meaning, you have to beat the living daylights out of it. In fact, if you go on Google, you can get a video of how it's done. I'm serious. I watched it. So now I'm an expert. I know just how to do it. See, you take this dough, this lump of dough that has this yeast in it, and you fold it in, fold it over, and then you take the bottom of your hand and you smash it. After you've smashed it, you fold it in, fold it over, and smash it again. You fold it in, fold it over, and smash it again, and you just smash, smash, smash. And it's in the smashing that the yeast infiltrates invades the entire three measures of meal. And without the smashing, it wouldn't happen. You kneel at an altar of prayer and say, Jesus, I want you in my total life. And he says, I'm going to smash you. I'm going to smash you. See, if you had any idea this, that, what this was, that this Christianity was escaping from, dream on. It's an entering in two. If you thought for one single moment that you could kneel at an altar of prayer and God would put a force field of his presence around you and protect you from everything that would be uncomfortable for you, you were wrong. If you thought you were going to come from the slavery of Egypt into the promised land and you were going to end up in the promised land without half starving to death and wondering where your water was coming from and wondering where your, how your kids were going to drink and wondering where, oh, good night, we got manna again today. And that there were going to be no hardships along the way. You were dreaming. Because the way he invades your, see, if he did not smash you, if there were not difficulties in your life, you would not have his presence invading that difficult area. See, you've got to get this. So the design of this thing is that God enters in my life and, hey, I have him within. Oh, that's good. But what about this area in my life where I'm struggling? How's he going to get into that area? Smash me. Well, I don't want to be smashed. Well, you wimp. <laughs> Which is why we've developed a prosperity gospel. A 
of don't you want joy? Don't you want peace? Don't you want happiness? Don't you want tickles up and down your spine? Don't you want your kids to have straight teeth? Give your life to Jesus as if Jesus was going to be the solution of protection against every kind of conflict in your life. And folks, it isn't true. Why? Because the very design of this, the very design and essence of Christianity is that he would invade your life and he would not move through your life and master you except as it took place through the needing. So what are you trying to say, man? I'm trying to say, hey, quit griping, quit complaining, buck up, kid. God is moving. And you are being invaded. And every problem that confronts you, you should embrace it, look it right in the eye and say, whoa, smash me again. Because he's invading new areas of your life as you respond in that smashing. That's the principle of the cross. Jesus, forgive me for my complaining, my belly aching, I've questioned you like you didn't know what you were doing. I've blamed you like you were leaving me dangling. I've criticized you because I thought you weren't treating me right. I've questioned you because you didn't answer my prayer. I made demands and told you what I wanted. And after all, I'm here and I know what's needed. And you didn't listen to me. Forgive me, Jesus. Because I've hindered the invasion of the leaven in my life. And you were needing me, smashing me, moving into new areas of my life, permeating me, And I was complaining while you did it. And out of one side, oh God, forgive me. Out of one side of my mouth, I said I wanted you. And out of the other side of my mouth, I was belly aching when you were doing the very thing I asked you to do, which was bring me into intimacy and the fullness of your spirit and the fulfillment of your dream in my life. And you know how thick I am, God. I probably, even after saying all of this, still will come up to moments when I revert back to my ignorance. But please remind me of this reality. And some of us here tonight, God, are going through tough times. But then how are you going to invade my life if you don't push on me? So, Jesus, would you give me the ability tonight to trust you in the midst of the pressure as you put your hand on me and press me and fold me in and fold me over and press on me 
and fold me in and fold me over and press on me. Please. Please. Heads are bowed. Your personal fulfillment, fulfillment will never be experienced without the invasion of the leaven. Fight against it, barricade it, push him off, and you're going to be a hard cracker that's going to be thrown away. Three measures of meal that won't be worth anything. Your value, your destiny, personal destiny, is found in his invasion. Turn him loose in your life and let him do in you what he wants to do. There is a destiny and purpose beyond your personal fulfillment because God has such a plan for you that it's not only your personal fulfillment that he desires, but he wants to use you involved in the lives of others and a plan that's far beyond the limits of your life. Will you let him fulfill you personally that he might fulfill his plan universally? How is he going to do this? He's going to need you, smash you, fold you, invade you, and he cannot invade you. Without the pressure of the crisis in your life. Every circumstance that comes to your life is a divine opportunity of the pressing of his presence stronger in the areas of your life. Will you run to that? Will you embrace that? Will you open to that? moments of seeking. Be obedient.